I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes. We'll start off with, I think that I shall never see such a collection of excessive bloviation you need that you see right here every Saturday night at the College of Complexes, Nito. That attempted poetry, but if you guys have been looking at the message boards, we've been having some very lucrative talent in that such. On another note, on another note, uh, one of our most frequent uh, college guests who's accompanied me over the years, her name was Elisa Chinlin, passed away last night. I, uh, she has been sick for a number of years, but I did want to let you know, I do not have any funeral or, or arrangements yet, but she was a good companion of mine. And, uh, for any of you who know her and may have over the years, she was a definite uh, contribution to the college, especially giving me this when I would give a little appropriate. <laughs> All right. The college consists of, of the following format. We'll have a speak, we'll have our brief announcements period, our speaker who will then speak, and then a question and answer period, and then afterwards our infamous rebuttal period where you shall be able to speak usually in the four minutes on, on or off the topic. And uh, we only have two rules here at the college. If you guys want to repeat after me, the first one is one for the time, and the second is no personal attacks. Oh. Oh. Yeah. All right. Tonight, our... I got the wrong part up here. Okay. Tonight, Ted Bellacore, Executive Director and Lecturer at the University of, Law, of Chicago Law School, is going to be talking about social change. It's a people and policy funded nonprofit that empowers and amplifies the voice and power of the marginalized via film, coalition building, and by providing advocacy legal and technical assistance for individuals and organizations. The best way to break the cycle of poverty, prison, and violence is to give people a real alternative. We do that by providing all interested, not those who can afford it, the training needed to get uh, what the well-paying jobs of today and tomorrow. Let's get started with our announcements period. Uh, who has an announcement? So please come on up real quick. Andy, you always have once to come on up and give them. Or Charlie. I want one of them well-paying jobs. Go to school, get some college under your belt, and get, then they can have one like you had for all those years yeah. in the government. Let's give them a warm welcome for Todd, please. Yay! You're our postmaster, so thank you, Todd. You got the floor. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's been an honor to be invited here by the College of Complexes. I can't think of a better time to celebrate something as critical as free speech <coughs> in our current state of affairs. And uh, also had a great opportunity to have a conversation with George, Bob, and Richard, and of course, Mr. Paddock back there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing on social change. Uh, but before I begin, we, I also have an announcement. Uh, October 3rd, 13th through 15th, we have a Social Change Film Festival that will be taking place at the Harold Washington Cultural Center. And anyone here who would like to go, I'll uh, give you a free ticket. Uh, we're showing films, talking about everything from the Israel conflicts to uh, issues that are going on uh, with developing countries and uh, lack of water access, racial justice issues, criminal justice issues, human trafficking. We have films about pretty much every significant injustice that you'll see. And of course, we'd love for your voices and your input to add to the robust discussions that take place after the film. Harold Washington, October 13th through 15th, the Cultural Center of 47th, and I'd love to have you there. But now, with, without any further ado here, is it? It's on. Should I hold it? Is this better for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Can everyone hear what I said up until now? <coughs> yes. I'm yeah. sorry also for the loss of Hallie. That sounds like a big loss. Uh, that's, thank you very much. But my name is Todd Belcourt. I'm an executive director of a nonprofit called Social Change. And we do three things to revolutionize service provision in this country. One, we provide free legal assistance to people who are denied access to basic necessities. 
The second thing is, instead of just providing legal assistance to people who need it, we also teach them how to navigate the courts and how to represent themselves in courts so they can help themselves but also help others who are dealing with similar issues. The other thing we do is we work with community members to create their own advocacy platforms so they can speak their issues and put them in policy form and be in a position to craft legislative solutions to the systemic problems that, that oppress and keep people down day to day. So whether it be the new Jim Crow, whether it be poverty, or whether it be other oppressive forces, it's important for people to have their own tools and the ability to amplify their voice in such a way that it can be heard and that they can do something substantive to do something about the oppression that surrounds. The third thing, as you just heard, is abuse film. There's no better vehicle to help people understand the struggle and issues that are unique to another population that may be foreign to me or you than to see it and feel it through film. So that's why we formulated something called the Social Change Film Festival, which will take place in Chicago, LA, and New York, showcasing films from all across the world, documenting injustices, and providing people who see the films for opportunities to do things about the issues in the film. So it's really important that people, especially folks who know what's going on, who are attuned to what's going on around the world, to be in a position to be at the forefront of these conversations, be part of the discussions about whatever's going on, but also be part of solutions and help build the most productive and robust solutions to the various issues that we see today. And we go about that every day through social change. So an average day for me is going to community organizations, working with them, hearing cons constructive concerns about lack of job opportunities, uh, violence. I mean, there's no question that there's something drastically wrong in this country as we speak. No matter what your political beliefs may be, you can tell that there's certainly a sense of hopelessness that's pervading and there's, there's violence that's resulting. There's only over 45 million people in poverty. And these, are, these are issues that are, are not intractable but are so overwhelming they, they seem to take over every bit of media and take over a lot of our conversations. But it's important to recognize that these are problems that are a result of systems and rules that can be changed. Things that are written can be unwritten. Things that are written can be changed. So that's why I engage in policy advocacy in, in Illinois and other states across the nation. I work with organizations and individuals to help them amplify their voices and needs to make sure that the, the letters of the law represent the will of the people. So what that looks like in practice for social change, we've worked with several organizations in Illinois and Missouri to help them establish a policy platform in areas of economic equity, criminal justice reform, and also police accountability. And we've gotten seven laws passed to undo some of the harm that's already in place based on what current law used to allow. So what that relates to in things like bail reform, we worked to reform the bail system. We weren't able to remove cash from it completely. But we did make it so a lawyer is required to ensure that people are in a better position to have their case represented before the judge. We also ensure that there's a codification that the law required that people's means were considered by the judge. Right now, that's a common law uh, consideration, but that's not required by statute. And as you know, oftentimes judges did not take all that information into account. So as a result, we have a significant portion of our jail population who are in jail for no other reason besides their inability to pay. And that sort of uh, poor people's prison is not what America is supposed to be built on. But it's certainly a mechanism that's been used throughout society to keep a certain population in a certain way. So what we've done is try to fight that by making sure that people not only have counsel in that process, not only have their means considered, but also every day they spend in jail, they get credit towards whatever their bail amount may be. Another thing we work towards is reforming, making sure there's opportunities, but not scams in prisons. We had a campaign titled exactly that, and what it did was ensure that there's constructive, real, significant educational opportunities for people who are in prison. So that means getting access to content control tablets so they can better themselves and learn vital skills and information that would be helpful for them upon release. But also it means providing entrepreneurial classes, um, business communication, business plans, uh, speech, speech making, whatever it may be, so people who would then be immediately subject to the new Jim Crow as soon as they're released, understanding that finding employment may be difficult and impossible, give people with the skills and, and the work ethic the opportunity to build the jobs and build the businesses that we know they have the ability to build. Uh, the third thing is, you, as you may already know, people may pay as much as 21 times as much for the same services that we pay for, for things like phone service, uh, any day-to-day -day service by virtue of the fact simply because you're in prison. So losing your liberty means you, you're putting yourself at risk to be legally scammed. 
Uh, and that's, that's unacceptable. So what we did was we worked with the legislature to ensure that the lowest possible cost was what, was what had to be taken in terms of bids as it relates to services provided to our men and women who are incarcerated. And in addition to that, it also removed the commissions that jails and prisons were actually getting off of particular prison, prisoners, inmates, uh, to ensure that there's less of a profit motive for the jails and prisoners to take certain sorts of packages and certain service providers. We're also actively working with Cook County Jail to get them to be a leader in this so that around the world there could be an understanding that you can have responsible practices in terms of business practices, but also ensure that people who are in locked up, who are incarcerated, have an opportunity to come out better than how they came in. And that's what those three particular pieces of legislation are intended to do. Uh, as it relates to uh, in Missouri, uh, of course, we've been working on um, police accountability issues in Chicago. And I was on the police accountability task force and worked on our recommendations there. But Missouri has also a significant issue with violence and police brutality. And we were able to get a whistleblower law on the books there, which allowed for uh, people to call out police officers and have affirmative protections uh, to protect them, not only their identity, but provide even further protections if need be, based on a potential threat or retaliation as a result. And I think these aren't, these aren't everything, but for an organization with a small budget like we have, uh, we're proud of the accomplishments and we're proud of the fact that, more importantly, over 50 individuals we've had a chance to work with over the last year alone are now thought leaders and uh, leading advocates in the ecosystem of providing legal assistance, helping people navigate the courts, helping people represent their voice and concerns before state legislatures, but also uh, people who are leaders who are, we need more soldiers in the field. And if you're going to change a, a climate, there's no question that it's kind of a war for the soul of the country right now. We need to make sure we're building and guarding more soldiers up with the skills they need to fight that fight. And that's what we're doing every day with through social change. And we use film as a mechanism to bring people who may not normally be interested in some of the issues that happen day to day uh, to be educated but also inspired. You know, have their consciousness pricked and feel like there's something they need, need to do. Feel that moral call to action that's implicit as in, in any sort of heart to heart sort of transaction. Ensuring that people who may not otherwise be inclined, people who may otherwise not even understand what's going on in the South Side or in Africa or in India, may say, hey, it's time for me to do more. And that's the goal of social change, to get people to do more, but also give them all the resources necessary to be effective when they intend to do so. So uh, I want to make sure I give that overview. Uh, certainly our plans over the next five years is to continue to build out to more states. Our sister states, Michigan, Indiana, uh, some of the states where there's more robust debates on some of these issues, uh, Texas, Florida, California, New York. Um, but it's also important that we go to different neighborhoods and, and make sure we're, we're being a good steward and representative and, and an amplifier for communities across Illinois. So that's why I feel especially honored to be here today. Uh, I spent most of, my, most of my time on the south and west sides of Chicago, and it's great to hear uh, all the incredible discussion that you're having about where this country should be. And I'm hoping there's something we can do as social change to move that forward. So uh, I'll keep my, my actual comments brief here, because it sounds like there's a robust Q&A, but also a, a rebuttal, and I'm looking forward to all of those. But thank you for your time, and I appreciate your attention today. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. He's got five more time for a presentation. Yes, he does. <laughs> okay. If you want to keep... 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Why don't you tell yeah. us All right, about... Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Then. All right. Uh, what drew me to this work is I grew up... Uh, as a, uh, my mother had four kids. She raised us by herself, uh, one of which my oldest brother was paraplegic. And uh, she raised them in Dearborn Homes, which is a project in the south side of Chicago. And I saw her every day work and cry and sacrifice and beg people sometimes so that we had the basic necessities we needed to get education, which she knew was our key. She knew that was our way out. And uh, she was able to do fundraising, but along that process, I learned a lot about life in terms of what it's like to have a paraplegic brother who had an entire society not take his, his, you know, his handicap into account. So we had to wait for five or ten buses to pass before one would come that had the ability to take him where he needed to go. I knew what it was like to be mulatto, you know, mixed. So now I, I, I know it's like not be dark enough, not be light enough, be called names or results, or whether it be University of Michigan where I was called names, or whether it be in South Side Chicago. I know what it's like to deal with that. Um, and I know what poverty feels like. I know what it's like to study by candlelight. I know what it's like to not have the lights on. I know what it's like not to have heat on in the home. 
so these are the experiences I talk about as some, um, you know, activist voyeur, you know, who's just trying to enjoy and, and, and feel some sort of self-value based on liberating or solving someone else's problems. These are problems I've seen and lived myself. And I've seen and lived how uh, my mother had to deal with a lot of these things, but I know one thing, that a lot of people don't have the mother I have. They don't have someone who's willing to fight for them to make sure that everything's aligned and that they're able to get the opportunities that other people aren't able to get. A lot of people don't have my, my brothers and sisters to keep me in line and, and keep a lookout and keep people who are bad influences away from me. So it's important for us to recognize that not every family has all the tools it needs to have a chance. So that's where the communities come in. That's where government comes in to make sure that these barriers to success do not keep people from fulfilling their potential. So um, that's part of the reason why I decided to become a lawyer, because I wanted to remove the barriers to opportunity that are consistently placed in the way of poor people, in the way of brown people in this country. Uh, so the purpose of social change is to systematically address all those barriers and transform them, to remove them so people who care and want to do one, a particular you know, occupation or who want to pursue a career of some sort aren't limited because of finances or aren't limited because their network or are unlimited because of the neighborhood they grew up in. Uh, so that's the longer term trajectory. And um, I was always taught to be brief when I presented things. So I, I'm sorry if I'm briefer than usual. Uh, but I, I actually enjoy the, the robust conversation I anticipate and going back and forth in terms of engagement in local politics, state politics, how things are different here in Illinois versus Missouri, which is a super majority Republican place. Um, I'm happy to talk about all those things. But what I do know, uh, the solution isn't to spend time um, trading acerbic insults with, with people who don't agree with you. Uh, if there's ever a time to try to build bridges, it, it's certainly not. And that's, that's the reason why I think we've been so effective at social change. Because um, we don't care what people look like, what they believe. I think we all believe in advancing liberty and opportunity and justice. So let's work from that frame and see what we can do together. And recognize also the threats to those three pillars of society that our current predicament lends itself to. I mean, when you, we've got a lot of things assailing our basic principles as a country, whether it be on a federal government level or otherwise, and we have to defend those. And those things aren't partisan, and uh, we have to remind people of that. And sometimes it takes me reminding people, sometimes it takes me asking someone in this group to, to be the credible messenger to, to rally the troops or talk to someone person to person. But there's no question, the best way to, to really communicate with someone is heart to heart. And you have to do that in person. You have to spend time developing relationships. And that's part and parcel of what we do at Social Change. Are we there any All questions? Right. Questions? Well, we'll get in there. Andy, you want to moderate? Or do you? Okay, and, and let's I can just pull on people. All right. I, 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 I teach. Uh, this gentleman has a finger up first, and then you I was interested in uh, your discussion about prisons. Okay. That um, the people who run the prisons are making commissions off the services that the prisoners are buying. And I know some people who were in a uh, federal uh, farm up in Wisconsin, in Oxford, and um, you know it was you know pretty much an open prison for white collar people mostly. And but a bunch of them were working for a company that was making furniture. So there's a company that the prison system is uh, supplying furniture and other things too, and who, who is that, what is that company and where are they selling this stuff? Do you know? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have an opportunity to hear the gentleman's question, and if I'm not capturing it correctly, please let me know. But he was asking point blank, in terms of the prison industrial complex, uh, where they have entire industries dependent on prison labor, uh, tell me a little bit more about that as it particularly, particularly relates to uh, building and constructing furniture while in prison in this case, a federal prison in Wisconsin. Um, that, there's no question that's taking place every day. Uh, and the push and pull is, is kind of unique because as we desire to help people build skills and build trade skills or vocational skills or tech skills, whatever it may be, you generally, in, in order to enhance that you know, population skill, whoever it is, whether uh, you know, free or in prison, you want to give people a chance to practice. You want to give people a chance to actually do what it is that they're learning. And um, the push and pull comes well, when outside businesses uh, profit and treat that labor as a way to undercut what they should be paying everyday people to do the very same work, that's where the issue comes uh, into play more significantly. 
So one of the things that we, we work towards at Social Change is making sure people are actually paid a significant wage based on the, the level of their work. Uh, because right now, based on uh, the 13th Amendment, there is that clause in there that allows people to, to not be uh, subject to or you know, actually have uh, be subject to the same laws in terms of you know what the minimum wage would be or what the expected payment should be. So um, that's one of the things we're actively fighting for, but there's no question that's, that's a significant issue that's rampant. And uh, it's a push and pull of if we want to provide skill opportunities for people and give them a chance to build on those skills, then how do we then compensate them? And there's no question that, that companies are certainly profiting uh, uh, hand over fist over to the prison labor. But then how do we now hold the companies accountable to make sure that they pay people properly and make sure those families are taken care of? And that's an ongoing matter. Do you know who the companies are? I think I can answer that. They have prison industries and they market their stuff to other government agencies or the military. And I think they even made things like boots. I don't believe they were available to the public for sale. But they would make like bookcases and things like that. Uh -huh. But they were available only through the federal supply schedules for use by the government itself, either civilian or military. It wasn't sold to the public. Yeah, but they still made money. Yes, these are private <laughs> for profit. The government's paying itself. These are private for-profit companies, that is what I was asking. There are private for-profit companies that are doing it yeah. well. Um, certainly there's no question that there's you know, license plates that are hammered out as a result of things like that. There's also, as you mentioned, there's things like furniture being done. And so when attention was put on the companies who were doing that, they either shied away from doing it, so uh, that became an issue in itself, because then people are, are able to build a skill, uh, at least in that constructive setting. Um, in, in that prison environment, but also it means that people are less likely to be taken advantage of real labor when they have no control over their rights. Yes, um, I have two questions. One, would you do kind of a brief analysis of the, of the new Jim Crow? And the second one is, um, uh, could you go into the specifics of, of, of a part of your plan that that you, you say you teach people skills. How do you do that? Where do you do that? How many people are in the class? What skills do you teach? Sure. That kind of stuff. Okay, uh, there's two questions in there. Uh, the first is, can I give you a, a synopsis of the new Jim Crow? So uh, I'll try to keep that under a couple of minutes. The second one was, uh, what sort of skills and opportunities do you provide to make sure people are in a better position to take care of themselves and their families? All right, the first question, the new Jim Crow, <clears throat> what that is, is that really the reinvention of slavery through legislation. So the way in which legislation has been used as a tool to oppress since the beginning of, civil of you know, the United States is founding. Um, so whether it be uh, from emancipation to reconstruction to, uh, you know, you have vagrancy laws, uh, there were things that were disproportionately enforced against people of color when they were just being found in particular places just by virtue of being seen, that was enough to then arrest somebody, and then of course it's subject to this 13th Amendment we were talking about, where uh, that's an exception. People can be treated, put right back into slavery, so to speak, by virtue of the fact that they're uh, subject to a criminal justice system. Uh, so that's that's actually been the blueprint, whether it be Jim and Jane Crow, uh, even after the Civil Rights Act, uh, you, you still have to deal with the issue of, now what we're going to do is go out of our way to militarize populate and occupy communities and ensure that we're putting criminal records on a disproportionate number of the people that we want to uh, keep in a particular position, that we want to keep power over. Uh, so that's what's taking place now. I mean, that's why we have over 70 million people with arrest records of some sort that can serve as a legal justification to deny people access to basic necessities like education, housing, employment. Uh, so that, that's how that's jumped and it's how it's continued to manifest. And one of the reasons that, one of the ways we fight that is by providing constructive and serious skills and opportunities. I'll make sure I call on you, you don't have to keep your hand on the public number. Uh, but the second thing is uh, providing the, the direct legal assistance to make sure we can either remove it from people's criminal history or limit the negative impact that it has on someone's criminal history. So that means making sure people access remedies like sealing and expungement, which limits who can look at old criminal history to just a small population of individuals, usually law enforcement. Um, but also helping people access a remedy that fewer people know about called Certificates of Good Conduct. 
And that's something where people can actually go to court um, and make the case that they turn a life room by clear and convincing evidence. And if they can do that, they get something from the judge that indicates that they're fully rehabilitated, that they can present that to any sort of entity, and they should no longer be denied opportunities by virtue of their criminal history. And what that looks like in practice, if I have a drug conviction, the law currently says that I'm not allowed to work in the schools. So I have a drug conviction, and that's what the law, the statute's clear. Um, but if I have a strict of good conduct, then I can't. So instead of being denied an opportunity to be a service to the youth in our communities for the rest of my life, I now can access and be that asset that we need our community members to be. Uh, in terms of the hard skills, though, it's important that uh, we recognize that, that jobs are already hard to get as it is, but they're even more difficult in our communities to find jobs where you can actually get a living wage and be in a position to take care of yourself and your family and move into the middle class. So I work with an organization called Blue 1647 to help provide individuals of all ages and all interests uh, the 21st century skills necessary to begin businesses, learn tech skills, and be in a position to access the job gap, which is so significant internationally. Because um, right now we're actually we're importing a lot of talent in areas of healthcare and tech. Um, but things that we could be doing right now locally, especially amongst our youth who are already engaged in their phones, already know that the, the next technology, I think the, the key to really stopping the violence is giving people a true alternative in that regard. If you can tell people that you can make $50 an hour if you learn to spend 25 hours a week working on this particular thing, you're surprised by how many you decide they'll take that path. So that's one of the options. The other is um, Developers Academy has two things. One, developing apps, but the other is developing neighborhoods and communities and properties. Uh, we have a whole wave of, of completely decrepit properties in, in, in Chicago and across Illinois. And we have a, really a, 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 ca a class of people who are developers who are not passing on those skills to the uh, next generation of future developers. Uh, and there's also opportunities and properties that developers of a certain sort of ilk won't even consider because they're, they're too low money for them, so to speak. So what we do is we work with another organization um, called 44 Acres to make sure that there are people in a position to learn how to rehab, build, gut homes, and be in a position to become um, the labor force necessary to, to be these developers. So we can also take control of our communities in terms of making sure we can maintain control of properties, make sure properties are, are, are up to snuff, but also making sure that people aren't coming from outside and, and profiting off the properties and communities that are foreign. So those are a couple of examples of things we're doing day to day to help people learn these skills. But uh, in terms of empowerment, we make sure people know how to represent their issues uh, and talk about things like messaging and lenses you use and understanding your audience and things like that to make sure people can be uh, as effective as possible in relaying the issues that are concerning to them. But also as much as anything, make sure people know how to access these legal remedies on their own. So everything I do, or uh, people I work with, or lawyers I work with, we're doing it to teach people so they can do it. We'd say they're kind of their supervising attorney almost. So we're teaching people how to be advocates, not just for themselves, but for their families and community members that they know. Yes, sir. I wonder if this is a, your response to the current uh, political landscape. Uh, the gentleman asked my response to the current political landscape. Uh, I would say, um, Chaos is my response to the political <laughs> landscape. I think um, no matter what your political belief, I think I don't. I don't think people in the, around in the country are clear that we're that we we're we're on a, a strong path for continuing the growth uh, that we are starting to see. So I think um, there's concern, and I think there's a lot of uh, people, whether it be in protests or outside of that. Uh, who are trying to voice their concerns. And I think you see that at a really prolific place, uh, whether it be issues related to DACA, issues related to wars that are ongoing, or issues related to foreign policy positions in terms of approaches to North Korea or, or otherwise, or even issues related to the, the, the lack of progress of promised jobs and the, and the like and here domestically. I think there's a lot of things that the, the administration is working towards um, that may fulfill some of the promises in terms of jobs for everyday people but they haven't yet manifested. So I think that's yielding a lot of concern, and as a result, you're seeing a lot of chaos, because you see a lot of people who are kind of hunkering in their corners and sticking to you know people who are like them. And any time in history when you have people doing that, it's bad for the nation. And I think this is an example where that chaos is yielding sort of lack of togetherness that we need to really build and move forward. Yes, gentlemen, in the future. 
Last week on, uh, on Meet the Press, uh, Senator uh, Tom, what, what's his name? Senator Tom Cotton. Senator Tom Cotton was saying the problem in this country is all these illegal aliens and refugees and DACA people taking all these jobs, depressing the the, uh, the uh, wages. And those jobs could be going to American blacks. They're Americans. They've been here 200 years. And homeless. We don't have to give these to foreign people coming into this country. Do you agree? It's longer than 200 years. I don't know if it, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know if you all had a chance to hear a gentleman's question, but he was asking, uh, he was recanting, I guess something was on Meet the Press, where Senator Cotton said something along the lines. I'm agreeing with him. Oh, agreeing with him. Well, uh, yeah. where, where the Senator Cotton said, and this gentleman said, said that um, people from out of the country are taking jobs that could be t occupied by other people and uh, who are from this country, and uh, do we think that's a significant issue? I think, um, I think in, when you talk about the immigration debate, I think people who get off light in the entire discussion of accountability are employers. I think at the end of the day, employers are the ones who hire people, they're the ones who set the rates in terms of what people are being paid, and despite the fact that they may be one of the first populations to say, um, yes, there, there's a lot of immigration here and people who are undocumented, they're not the first to also admit that they're part of the reason that people come here, because they want to hire people because they know that they can pay them less. And I think that sort of uh, in, abuse by employers is something that, uh, if we can get to the, the bottom of that, I think we'd be in a better position to then point fingers at other people. Um, but certainly, I, I, I can't imagine of blaming someone who's trying to leave and go through whatever the hell they have to overcome crossing whatever obstacles just to be in a position to work. Uh, so I understand what that may be like, but I think what Senator Cotton is also ignoring is the way that the mechanization of the labor force and the way in which companies are not taking a responsible approach to providing job opportunities for people in communities are limiting and drying up jobs, so leaving fewer jobs than ever before. Uh, so I think uh, there should be more of an honest discussion about that, uh, about how uh, it used to take 24 people to make a car, now it takes four. Uh, I think we need to talk about what that means for the middle class and how we need to actually reapportion some of our attention to make sure people are learning the skills to meet the gaps in tech and healthcare and whatever it may be, so we can respond and make sure that Americans are getting jobs in the future. We're not continuing to import labor from outside. But these illegals are hurting American blacks most of all. I don't agree with that. I don't think that people who are undocumented are hurting American blacks. I think employers can hire whoever they want. And if they choose to hire someone, uh, uh, whether it be a Latino or someone who's not undocumented instead of an African American, that's something that they should be held accountable for if they discriminate. If they discriminate in a legal way. But I think the bigger issue is if they're paying people less than people should be entitled to be paid then that's what we should get at. And the reason why they're hiring someone who's undocumented versus anyone, white, black, or whatever, is because they shit get paid the shit. most. And I think that's the significant issue, the wage stuff that's happening rampantly throughout the country. Because uh, so I think at the end of the day, if employers are being held accountable for that, then they would hire American citizens instead. <laughs> yes, sir, is it Andy? Yeah, Andy. Uh, uh, boy, uh, my question is, uh, how do we address the issue of billionaire business owners doing exactly what you're talking about where they pay illegal aliens to come here because they don't have to pay them uh, medical benefits or anything else. They can pay them less than American workers and they, they work hard without complaining because they can be deported or you can steal wages from them, steal overtime. You can't do that with American workers that you know, understand uh, a little bit about uh, what their rights are as, as employees. How do we address that issue in this country? Because it's, it's widespread, isn't it? Yeah, um, to the gentleman's question, the issue of wage stuff is widespread. Um, and that's why it's also extremely important to have uh, the Department of Labor or, you know, actually be a robust entity that's enforcing these laws aggressively. And as we have fluctuations in leadership in the administration on the federal and, and the, the local level, um, you have varying appetites for trying to enforce these very laws. Um, so you have oftentimes the same people who are, are decrying the presence of, of, of people who are undocumented are the same people who are profiting the most off the presence of the undocumented. So they, they use the fear 
to continue to maintain power while still manipulating the people who are in the lower class. And I think the laws are there. I think the issue is whether or not we can enforce them significantly and robustly enough. And I think losing or at least having something like DACA being at risk shows what people have at stake. Uh, speaking out means you may lose your family member or someone you love, and you may not know what's going to happen to them. That's a hammer that gives people a lot of leverage when it comes to um, underpaying or not paying or treating somebody because your loved ones are all you have. And you're going, to, you know, traveling such a, a godforsaken distance just to be in a country for a chance to work. So I, that's why it's important to repair something like DACA and make sure it's something that remains. But that's why it's also important to hold employers accountable. So they're treated, anyone here should be treated the same as raised by, by employers. Fairly, decently, have a chance to work at a decent wage and not be mistreated. And no matter what they look like, what their background, that should be the case. But they're not American. Well, why should we treat them like Americans? Because that's what we believe, right? We believe that everyone who's here should be treated decently. And I think um, to take advantage of people by wage or otherwise would be something that flies in the face of the But you guys will be the first ones to, you guys will be the first ones to hire these immigrants. And we'll be the first ones to go away when you want them. You I'll be the about first one to build a wall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we know that. Build yeah, we know wall. that. You know, we're going to be we're going to be paying these guys to come here in less than 20 years. We're going to be paying these guys in 20 years when it comes to demographics. But the green cards are illegal. Illegal. Yeah. Build a wall, man. Well, you'll have a chance to do your rebuttal. We know. We know. Sorry. <laughs> But definitely, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, yes, please, right. uh, Richard. Do you work with politicians, or are All you the time. Are, are you outside of the political? No, I'm a lobbyist. I work with politicians. Okay. That, that was the extent of it. <laughs> Let me give you a little more background then, because um, that when you leave it at that, it sounds awful. Um, so I am a, a community lobbyist. No one pays me to uh, fight for a particular issue. I, I, I represent community members, but you need to have a badge in order to be a position to continually. Uh, chase down legislators and, and, and the General Assembly. So that's why I am formally a lobbyist and I have to pay the little dues or whatever it may be. So then uh, I'm in a position to not only uh, testify and speak to legislators without outside, um, outside assistance, a letter or whatever it may be, giving me the authority. It also gives me the position to craft legislation, speak to the Legislative Reference Bureau so I can craft, testify, negotiate do everything necessary to make sure the most progressive legislation is possible as before. Do you have local politicians who cooperate with you? You know, I work with all 118 in the General Assembly and the uh, you know, House of Representatives, and I, I work with all 59 um, senators. I think, <coughs> well, one, I, 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 I approach everyone with the expectation that they'll vote for what's necessary. Um, uh, that's not always the case. Certainly not, uh, all my legislation has been bipartisan, but it certainly has not all been unanimous. Um, but there's no question that I have an uh, obligation to educate everyone on what's needed, what the community requires, what's required to make sure people have a chance to move forward with their lives. Whether they vote yes or no is up to their conscience and their community and their constituents or however they decide to determine their votes. But it's important for me to use my opportunity, the, the platform I have, and whoever I'm working with, to make sure we're building consciousness. So maybe they don't vote on this piece of legislation today, but maybe next year or whatever it may be, they may be part of the people who vote on something like um, providing education opportunities in prisons, which was something that got done unanimously. Yes, sir. Um, Bob? Yeah, I'm Bob. What do you think about uh, lawyers overall? Do they show much social concern? Do you have, do you have a hard time enlisting them to help in your cause? Okay, Bob was asking um, a question my father often asked me is, what do I think about lawyers? My father uses more swear words, though. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think um, to be a lawyer is uh, to have an opportunity to, 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 do, to ha really be the name and, and forefront of a, a profession that can be very noble. I think there's no question when you have, when you have understanding of something as, as critical to maintaining everyday society as laws and how to change them and how to be in a position to defend people who are dealing with them. I think that's that's a beautiful and amazing thing. I think what happens more often than not, though, laws are changed and the rules of the game are changed to benefit the people who have the most money and have the most influence. So what happens is that the lawyers who are tasked with defending those individuals and representing those individuals are essentially representing and defending individuals who aren't necessarily uh, 
uh, seeking for protection or assistance from the laws are intended to really help everyday people. So um, what I find to answer your second question within that, uh, I, I find like I, I can do a decent job of recruiting individuals because certainly, um, you know, people who make $250,000 a year helping BP or whatever um, also have some sort of conscious commitment to do something beyond helping um, BP defend itself in the oil spill issues. Uh, but I also will be willing to say I'm not as successful at getting those people to quit those jobs to do this sort of freedom fighting full time and dedicate all their time, talent, and energy to make sure that people are being liberated by the various structures that are keeping them fulfilling their potential. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I teach. That's one of the reasons why I go and speak to youth in high school, college, whatever it may be, encourage people who want to be a social worker, who want to be a policy advocate, to go to law school, people who want to be a doctor, to go to law school, are people who care about making sure that everyday people have a fighting chance. We need them to be the ones who are the voices in these courtrooms, in these corporations, and in these, um, these the halls of different legislatures. So that's what I fight for. Yes, I, I lost track of his next. I, I, one of the gentlemen. And this one. guy in the okay. neck. Okay. Uh, in terms of leveling the playing field, which I think is what you're saying, one of the things we need to do, we need to level the playing field. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the importance of a uh, tax system uh, to do that. How do you feel about our tax system now? And to be just a little specific, how do you feel about the Cook County soda tax? <laughs> All right, the gentleman uh, I'm officially in the hot seat now feels like uh, he asked me two questions. One, how do I feel about the tax system? And the second is, how do I feel specifically about the Cook County sugar tax or soda beverage tax? Yeah. And, um, so the first question, Illinois is actually fairly prehistoric as it deals with our tax structure. We have one of, no, it's true, I mean, I'm, I do work in Missouri, which is a super majority Republican state, and they have a more uh, progressive, liberal tax structure than we do. And I think the reason for that is, because there's an implicit understanding amongst folks that uh, we need to make sure that as people are becoming more successful, that they're more in a position to, to ensure that we continue to protect the liberties and opportunities for people who aren't necessarily at, have the same access. Um, so that's right. So I think that's that's one of the issues that, that you know a lot of these gubernatorial candidates are considering, and that's something that a lot of people are asking Ron about every day. What can we do to be more like Missouri in this case? Um, and I think that's something that's a legitimate conversation we need to have to make sure that we can all move forward and not worry about increasing nickel and dime sort of taxes, which is a good segue to the soda tax. I think um, in general, if you're going to provide a tax or increase a tax, you want it to affect everybody. You want it to be something that isn't just really impacting a small population of people, especially not a small population of people who are at least able to withstand the additional taxing. And when you have something like that, it's regressive taxing, and that's certainly what the soda tax represents. It represents taxing on the populations of people who are necessarily at least able to bear that burden, and that's why I'm not necessarily, I think it's, I think we should be a little more thoughtful in terms of broadening who we're looking for uh, to provide additional monetary relief for the county uh, instead of the individuals. I understand the, 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 the mention of, of health concerns. Um, but there's a lot of other unhealthy activities that aren't being taxed, and uh, coffee or otherwise. So I, I think there's things we can think through that could be more uh, a better overall solution for the county that doesn't have such an impact on people in our communities. Back in the back there, you got a question? Hi, I just wanted to, you know, we have syntax on, uh, you know, on tobacco with uh, alcohol, that sort of thing. And it seems to me with the diabetes epidemic in this country where when half the people are overweight and we're spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, Medicare and Medicaid on, on folks that are that have diabetes and other related problems, you know, sugar's a big problem in the United States. And a lot of young people are overweight, older, you know, about everybody is, so, but most people are. And it just seems to me that, you know, it's a legitimate syntax, just like uh, for cigarettes. Okay. Just a brief reminder that this part is the question part. We'll be going into rebuttals and later on. We well, appreciate yes, you. I, I was just, I was just no, no, we, we well, appreciate. The question is, what do you think about that? No. I'm not. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you think about yeah. sugar tax? No, and I think to your point, of, that was what they were trying to get at. So. The desserts they just brought out a second ago had an additional tax on it. The ice cream would have additional tax on it. I think the bottom line is there was research done on who this would impact and whether or not they have a significant enough voice to fight 
And then since they don't, then let's make it happen. From Tony Preckville. I'm not saying who or what. I'm just saying I think there's there's certainly that I don't know. I wasn't in any rooms, but I think there's no reason if we're concerned about sugar intake. But she's the one then, then ice cream joints, then hot and you know, hot dog joints that have a lot of sugar in the carbohydrates and the and All the, of them. Yeah, yeah, right. So I home. think you need to drink a lot every day. You only have to eat ice cream and cake every day. There you go. Every child in the world gets to drink several glasses of something every day. Charlie and then Charlie, what do you got? This guy's so babbling. I don't know why. He doesn't have a question. No, no, he'll have. It's a question. He'll have. He'll have. I mean, everybody's whining about sugar. <laughs> it's a question period. What about uh, cigarette taxes? They're 13 bucks right, a pack. Sir. It's getting a little red. Nice people started. settle down, settle down. Oh, Here's the go. Sergeant at arms. We had a thing called the war on poverty, and we passed all kinds of legislation. All right. Aimed towards eliminating poverty, and I'm surprised to learn that there's legislation that causes poverty. Where did this come from? How does, what, give me a specific legislation that means one, I don't, I can't even think of legislation that is written community specific. Sure, I'm happy to address that. Sure. That's actually easier than the, the sugar question in my mind. That's only like sweets as much as I do. I think uh, the issue is that there's, the explicitness isn't there, but anytime you close school, and then you increase police presence, and you have, you hyper uh, criminalize activity. Those are different thoughtful policy approaches that result. Administrative decision. That's not a law. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, you have laws that have regulations for schools that don't allow the teaching of certain curriculum that help people understand the basic competencies they need to be successful. That's those are laws. So, uh, you have issues of. Uh, there's what conduct, that there's legislation that you have to conform with in order to actually have a school in the first place and be funded. Well, uh, so bad. that's how they ensure that people are actually complying, because they, they tie it to money. And the other aspect is, in terms of how the police interact with community members, there's legislation that, determine what that determines what that looks like and protects police officers when people are being mistreated, even though the police may not necessarily be in the right in their particular circumstances. But no, what happens is when people are being military, uh, criminalized, that results in legalized poverty. Because now you have an arrest record, and you're allowed to tell people they can't work. You're allowed to tell people they can't live in this particular house. You're allowed to tell people that they can't get access to the jobs and other basic necessities that they need. And this is for a population of over 70 million people. So this is why poverty not only is something that's something that's so hard to break, but something that's actually become cyclical and generational. Because what happens then is people are denied opportunities, their children as a result are denied opportunities because then it becomes that much harder for their children to have a chance. Right. A child so have a chance. you think because people have a criminal record, that was legislated to hurt people? Yes. Did he get a job? I think so. That was intended to hurt because of criminal record? Well, I think just like anything else, when you have 40 years of evidence indicating what the outcomes are, and then aren't being changed, and you, you articulate that evidence and explain the outcomes that it's having and the way it's devastating families, and people still refuse to change it. Maybe there wasn't an intent explicitly then, but certainly it's hard to argue that you can't at least be aware of the impact and the, the need to do something about it now. And that's why we've been working on that over the last several years, but uh, I think it's still a significant issue that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. What do you think of Antifa as an agent of social change? I think they're kind of productive. <laughs> Antifa. No, that's right. Uh, tell me you understand what you think they're kind of productive. Because they get people against them. They want to tear down these statues yeah. under... under uh, uh, tear down our statues. Well, I, I, I think this is a perfect forum to discuss something like that. I mean, free speech is that important. I mean, and the people who are held accountable for you know whatever destruction they're, they're deciding to, to, to go about, then that's that's a choice that people are making in order to make their stand. I think um, as you start to think about what free speech means, I think it's also important to think about the way in which the courts have determined that free speech can be represented through money. And I think uh, if you talk about devastation, you're talking one thing is to talk about a statue, another thing is to talk about our democracy. I think when you have money that's actually corrupting the, the entire way in which our society is governed, I think that's a significant concern that I think should warrant more attention than 
some statues that can be repaired and hold those people accountable after the fact. But I think people should be able to protest, and to the extent that they violate laws, should be held responsible. But I, I think anytime you oppose fascism, I don't think that's something people should apologize for. They're the fascists. They're, 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 they won't accept free speech on the campus. They, they won't accept free speech. They're the, they're the fascists. Let's move on to the next question. Right here, next question. Bill Go ahead. Ahead. Um, I've, I've read and heard a lot of criticism that there's a lot, a tremendous amount of racial bias in the criminal justice system. And I was wondering if you could touch on that a little and, and tell us if your organization addresses it. Yeah, a, a brief way to really describe this quickly is uh, there's a delegation from Africa that came and see what our jails were like. And um, after spending time in the county jail for the day, they said, this is great, but where's, where's the jail for non-black people? Uh, so, and I, I say that, it, it's, it's unfortunate, because it, that, that's what the population looks like. You would think only people of color are the ones who are committing crimes, making any issues, and of course the data shows that know, white folks, non-black folks, or whatever, are just as likely to use drugs, if not more likely, whatever it may be. And of course, I had the opportunity to go to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where I saw more crimes take place on a day-to-day -day in white frat parties than I've ever seen in my entire life in the south side of Chicago. But the difference is, police don't enforce the laws, the same laws, the same way. Um, so this is what I'm saying, this kind of targeted, uh, intended, intentional, you know, be stuck in an intergenerational cycle of poverty, prison, and violence is, is an issue because what happens then, while one kid may get a slap on the wrist in the University of Michigan, hey kid, I know you're a college kid, be careful, don't do it again, another kid gets a hard time that completely changes the trajectory of their life. And I think that's a significant issue that we need to tackle no matter who's the president because it's something that's really damaging our ability as a country to, to take advantage of all the talent and wealth of talent that we have here. Over here. It's, you, you spoke about uh, a more equitable system of bonding for uh, people who have been accused of crimes. Could you uh, explain a little more about what's going on there, or what's going, what your, uh, your thoughts on that? That's right. Uh, the gentleman's question, I spoke about a more equitable system of bonding. We were advocating for taking cash out of the bond system entirely. So either someone's too much of a flight risk, too much of a danger to the general society, that it should be free or they're not, and let them go. Don't let money to keep people in there if you feel like they're not at risk and just because just they can't pay. Um, but what we found shortly after engaging in those conversations with clerks of the courts and people who represent courts all throughout the, the state is that uh, entire justice systems are, are dependent on the money from the, that, that are supposed to prevail. Um, so that's something that you can't necessarily dismantle unless you have a constructive uh, approach to funding the courts that doesn't rely on the back support. I don't think it should, but it'd be irresponsible for us to then do that and all of a sudden the entire system shut down. Uh, so what the best, next best thing we can do is make sure there's counsel, make sure people are represented and have their voice heard and their case made as powerfully and as zealously as, as possible and that, that hearing takes place, but also ensure that judges are taking means into account, uh, codifying, requiring that judges say, all right, Todd, uh, normally, uh, I, you know, I would give you a thousand dollars bond for that weed that you had, uh, but now uh, we're going to make it a hundred, so you can make sure you get out or an ankle bracelet to make sure that there's more of an incentive and a, a really a true consideration of the entire person uh, before the judge to, to ensure that people aren't locked up somewhere being poor. Get back. Uh, can you give me a brief outline on the process that you the war on drugs is disproportionate against the black folks. And can you give me a brief outline on how job search, once you have a record uh, or a conviction, whatever it is, misdemeanor or felony, how does that affect your ability to apply for a job? One's, one's ability to okay. Can you uh, give me an idea of what, what they're up against? Yeah, two questions. Of Talk about the disproportionate uh, contact of law enforcement with people of color and at to drugs. I mean, all you have to do is go to a Cubs game and see a lot of people using drugs, right? And, uh, but you don't see a lot of people being arrested. But if you spend a little time on the south and west side, uh, you don't see hundreds of thousands of people walking around. Uh, you see a few young men, young women who are on, but there, there's four or five police per you know, two or three square miles making sure that that conduct isn't taking place. Uh, when you have a close rate of the violence crime that we have in Chicago that's so low, 20, 30 uh, percent, I think as a society we, we're more interested in making sure people are murdering, people are held accountable, not necessarily that people are smoking a joint. So I think what, what you have in terms of the population, 
I mean, black people are five times more likely to be arrested for the same offense, um, seven times more likely to be convicted. So that, those are significant numbers. And it's the same offense, same circumstances. Those are jaw-dropping numbers. Like the for jobs. Yeah. That's right. So the, the second part of that question is now employment. Uh, what that means is employment, and it's a point of concern, uh, laws allow for employers to legally discriminate, not because of someone's color, but because of someone's criminal history. So what happens is it ends up being tantamount as a proxy because if you know the, the entire Cook County Jail is basically a jail for brown people for a county that's, you know, 45% brown, uh, then that population is being disproportionately subjected to the denial of job opportunities. Because the law says, you, no matter how gifted Todd is or whatever his background may be, uh, in terms of you know going to law school or whatever, presidents of his class, if he has a record, you can tell him no and hire someone who is less qualified because this person has criminal history. So that's why the criminal history is such an important uh, so the, scarlet letter. So the letter. job application is, have you ever had a conviction for a gun? Is that still on there, or I thought they took it off? No, uh, uh, we were part of the or? leaders in the advocacy to uh, what, what was called ban the box across the nation. We called it job opportunities for qualified applicants. So what that meant is you have to first figure out whether someone's qualified for the job, basically give them a, a, an interview, a notify them in an interview, and then that's when you can start asking about people's criminal history. So what the data shows is that people are, are five times less likely to view that same person um, as negatively if they knew that person's criminal history when they talked to them. So if I tell you, you know, I've had a DUI, that's different than when if you just look at a black and white paper and it's like, okay, you see someone's by, described by their worst mistakes in their lives and you're supposed to make a decision about their character based on that. But if you can talk to someone about it, talk through what happened, the circumstances, whatever it may have you, you, you see people differently. So it's a public, it's public record, right? The, uh, it is right. public record. Anytime so someone's arrested, say, anyone can look it up. They put in a social security number, and they can say, well, right. you know, Joe Blow here uh, was a robber, yeah, you don't even need a social security number, personal last name, and if you have date of birth, it's, you know, the more identifiers you have, the more accurate the record becomes. And um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is supposed to allow for me to view whatever it is that you're looking at, so I can at least be certain to tell you whether it's accurate. But that's often overlooked as well. It's up to the employer to hire you. I'm going to have to ask that we stop for just a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I really have two. Um, I could ask this. Uh, uh, you know that there's this uh, voter suppression thing uh, in the, the so-called commission run by uh, Chris Kobach. Um, is one of your priorities to maybe try to uh, uh, counteract some of that stuff? And I know you're mainly working in Illinois. In Illinois, of course, use the cross-check. There are people trying to get them to go with Eric, a different system that is not uh, political. Supposedly it's not partisan, this Eric, but we still have cross-check involved in Illinois. Uh, is, would one of your priorities be, uh, because this is uh, voter suppression, it's uh, obviously denying people the right to vote. Maybe a lot of people being the disadvantage that you're uh, promoting. Yeah, the gentleman's question is, um, the issue of voter suppression is real. Uh, what are we doing to provide opportunities to ensure that people who are unjustly being denied their right to vote and have a vote cast and also do something affirmatively to stop the efforts to further uh, limit who has the opportunity to vote. There's actually a lot of uh, money being put into organizations doing that sort of work. So we try not to duplicate a lot of labor that's already being done. So what we're doing is trying to do a new model for how we approach our services. So that's not amongst our priorities currently, only because there's so many other people in the field. Um, uh, but if there gets to be a point where you know we're able to solve enough of the problems or get enough of our own backing or enough advocacy plan of team to diversify more, we will. But unfortunately, uh, that's currently not something we work on right now. What are you doing to help the homeless? What are we doing? Oh, did you get this capture this question? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, what are we doing to help the homeless? Was the question posed. Uh, we, well, that's a, a popular refrain here, I see. Uh, it's a little wall. Uh, uh, no, uh, we actually worked with uh, Representative Justin Slaughter and Senator Maddie Hunter to uh, pass a piece of legislation that ensures that government jobs and opportunities are affirmatively uh, made to people who are formerly homeless or currently homeless who are uh, formerly in the juvenile justice system or currently in the juvenile justice system. Uh, to make sure that people who are dealing with seasons of homelessness are in a position to get access to the jobs they need to get out of it. Um, this is actually a good segue we, on tomorrow, between 1 and 4 in Hyde Park in the Silver Room. Uh, my organization, Social Change, another one, One Heart, One Soul, is having an art exhibit that's where the art is completely populated 
um, by uh, youth who have who are experiencing seasons of homelessness, who are who have artists and are selling the art, and all the, of course the proceeds go to them. Um, so it's another thing we're doing. We also uh, engage in uh, uh, both food and also clothing pantries. So we, we assemble clothing, especially around the, the holiday season when it gets colder, uh, of all kinds, whether it be dress clothes or winter clothes, to make sure people are in a position to weather the storms and then the cold weather that we have in Chicago and What about housing? They, they live under the vibe that they got kicked out of them. There are organizations where, and again, this is kind of like the house, the, the voter question before. I think the gentleman asked what about housing, what are we doing affirmatively about that. There's the anti-eviction campaign, there's the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and there's a couple other organizations on the national level doing things for homeless advocacy that are, you know, have a $20 million budget between them, and we have, you know, 150000 So we have to be more mindful about where we apportion our time to make sure we're as effective as possible, and that's not an area we can really invest time. You're talking about buying housing, building housing. You need to have you know at least a million and a half of operating uh, assets and income to, to deploy, and we certainly don't have that. Okay. Um, what is your or what is your organization's website, and how can we get to find out more about it online? Absolutely, our organization is Chicago Social Change org is our website. Chicago Social Change all one word dot org, and we're at site. CHI social change for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those things. And um, certainly I would love for you all to come out tomorrow for our art work on, on October 13th and 15th. And if, uh, if you mention my name, I'll make sure that you get in free because it's important that we have you there and have your, your wisdom that be some of the things that spur conversation and anchor a lot of our debate. Where is that taking place? And tomorrow at the Silver Room, uh, which is on 53rd. It's a, I think it's like 1536. Um, East 53rd Street, uh, but I'll, I'll look it up. A little east of the tracks. That's right. It's, a, well, it's actually a little west of the tracks. It's near uh, Mellow Yellow, if, okay. uh, for folks who are, know it that well. It's between Harper and Lake Park. Um, sorry, and that's kind of getting in the weeds. For folks who aren't as familiar with it, but uh, yeah. Okay, now one more question. Cubs or Sox fans? Oh, it's a bad. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. It's always how you got a question. <laughs> Thank you. Can I get another question? Yeah. Uh, legislation, when it's drafted, and I know people that write laws for the feds, but they, it's sort of like gender neutral. They, they're not community specific. And legislation may benefit one community over another, but I don't receive any legislation that harms community. That's what I mean. I, they, I'm trying to find, I'm serious, is there legislation that precipitates poverty right. of the community targeting it as a community? Well, one of the things though. I mean, yeah, I'm thinking like EPA law. You know, clean air law doesn't <coughs> talk about where it air is. Yeah, and the evolution of the conversation of the New Jim Crow, certainly the explicit mention of race has long been removed. Um, from laws and policies. So what you do now is consider disparate impact. So does a policy that doesn't mention uh, a particular protected class have a disparate impact on a particular population, whether it be women, people of color, whatever it may have you? And what, what's shown by data is there's laws that do. And one of which is certainly everything related to the criminal justice system. Um, another is certainly education policy. And as you talk about the EPA, um, there's certainly entire neighborhoods that are terrorized by the lack of enforcement of, of rules and laws um, that are supposed to be on the books for the EPA or otherwise um, because people people make a decision, a policy decision, administrative decision in terms of implementation that certain populations don't deserve the same protections as others. So that's why you need to have the policy decision. That's that's why some implementation is an issue. Uh, but the laws sometimes allow some of this stuff as well. I mean, they, the laws are changed in terms of the carbon amount, right? I mean, laws are changed also in terms of uh, how much people get in terms of the sentence they receive uh, for a, a minor offense. And so these are things that are hard laws, but certainly uh, the individual discretion is what ensures that certain populations are disproportionately impacted. And we rely on that data over a period of years to document that. Because as you're saying, they're not going to say, make sure you don't hire black people. But what they will say, in terms of what a legislator or a record may, I mean, a, a statute may represent, is people with a criminal record are not allowed to work in the schools. And what that looks like in practice 
is people with criminal records are black people, so black people more often are not able to work in the schools and be an asset to our youth. And that's some of the things we try to unseat, because as we all understand, people make mistakes, but mistakes should not necessarily disqualify you for life from opportunities if you're otherwise a, a qualified candidate. Where, where, one last where is the line between Quite hear you, if you don't mind. Where does a criminal record, I know about nexus things, they call it, outside of possibly schools, where does a criminal record preclude you from being an applicant? I, 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 it's actually harder to find a, a sort of occupation where it doesn't. Uh, I mean, uh, over 94% of, of employers preclude people from accessing at least one manner of employment because of a criminal history. Uh, now, it depends on what the criminal history is, and you're supposed to consider how long ago it took place. But 97% of employers look for criminal history, and 94% of them deny people as a result of the criminal history. Um, with 65 saying no, no matter what the conviction is, uh, no matter how long ago it is. So when you look at that sort of hard data on it, I know it's hard for us to, to sit and say, like, well, of course, why would we say no to someone just because they've been arrested? But it's happening every day, and the, the impact of it is absolutely devastating for entire families, but also communities. But that also includes just arrests, not convictions. That's right. Yeah. Even arrests that weren't resulting in a conviction can um, cause a sort of calamity. Can cause someone being kicked out of their subsidized housing. Can cause someone being lost, losing their job. I mean, even in the sports context, you've seen people lose access to their entire career, uh, let alone taking a knee. So I mean, there's there's a lot of different things to consider. And generally, uh, the criminal justice system is a way that excuses the discrimination that's intended uh, as an end result. Uh, three at the same time. The oh, young lady no, first. I'm just gonna, if you're, if you cannot get a license as a nurse if you've been convicted as a felony, and that's not the only occupation that you can't get a state license to do if you've been convicted as a felony. So that's a direct impact. Hairstylist. Or, I have a friend who was a hairstylist. He lost yeah. his license. Uh, Seventy-five percent of people are saying though that this is <coughs> Yeah, let me recap okay. what she was saying with these young, the young lady and the gentleman were saying so everyone heard it. Uh, occupational license, in order to have your own business or even to even take part in significant sectors of the economy, whether it be healthcare or schools or police officers, whatever it may be, you need to be licensed in some regard or uh, satisfy some sort of legal standard in terms of your eligibility. And all of those articulate criminal history as one of the considerations. So if people have criminal history more often than not, they're denied these opportunities. Yes, sir. I should know your name now. This is your, your fifth remark. What's your name, sir? George. George. 75% of the new police officers are minorities. Now, uh, affirmative action has been declared uh, unconstitutional. Uh, this is affirmative action, as far as I'm concerned. They, they didn't get the height. Discrimination against the white males. The gentleman's question is, um, is it, I'm trying to put it from what he said. He was saying, well, 75% of the new hires for police officers are, are of color. Uh, is that indicative of affirmative action? And, and I, I, you know, I think what's happening now is they're trying to prioritize hiring people from the communities to police the communities. Because you know the people and you're in a better position to actually understand the actors and the influences and actually do something about the crime and reduce crime. So if, if you're going to be hiring people to police communities that are predominantly black and brown, you expect the outcome to be in terms of who's hired people who are predominantly black and brown. Because right now, our police force is not represented the city by any means. You have over 75% of police force. Uh, that occupies, you know, 50% of our city that's 80% black and brown are, are white folks. Um, and that the community has stated as a concern is people who are not from here are less likely to understand what we're dealing with, but also they're less likely to treat us with respect. So I think they're responding to the, the clearing call from the community to ask for more people who are more understanding of what's going on in the communities. I think it's a representation. I think that's a stereotype that the white the police officers can't treat with respect, that's a stereotype. I think they do. Some don't. Well, I think it's representative of what the community is asking for. And um, it, it, I think also, generally, what we have gone through two years of listening sessions on community um, issues with police brutality. And uh, there's no question that the badge is kind of the, the power power inducing element that results in some of the, uh, the power dynamics that really cause one to treat another worse. Um, but there's no question that there's also a correlation yeah. in addition to the badge that uh, someone's color may have an impact. 
but for, you know, let me be full disclosure, two, three of my family are <coughs> police officers, and I'm black and white, two of them are white. And they, they recognize that they have a greater obligation to go out of the way to make sure they're being polite, because they understand that people are expecting them to treat them poorly since they've been treated so poorly for so long and so many other white officers previously. I got a question. Uh, that's in a follow-up uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, what is uh, the feeling? Uh, how, how do we deal with what many people recognize as an obvious problem with racist police? They just step out of a car and just shoot a black person. And, you know, it, it, there's no defense for this kind of stuff. But it's happening. Uh, why are the, the top levels of the police departments addressing this? Why is this still going on in America? And what can be done? Andy asked a, a very simple closing question, it sounds like here. He said, what are we going to do about uh, police officers who are shooting um, people in communities and not being held accountable by the higher ups, uh, particularly uh, for the, the, the white ones who are shooting black people? And I think this is why we're engaged in the police accountability conversation and trying to make sure the Department of Justice recommendations are being actually applied in a form of decree. Because um, the Department of Justice did find that there were violations, that the police department in Chicago was violating residents' civil rights in terms of the way they practice and, and, the, and the way they implemented the laws that they were supposed to be using to govern and protect our communities. Um, so the big, the first step is just hold people accountable based on the laws we already have in the books. And we're not doing a great enough job of that, but uh, State's Attorney um, Kim Lee Fox is actually one of the first who's going above and beyond to make sure that. We're holding police officers to the same standard, looking at all the evidence all the way through, and uh, holding people culpable but not sweeping things under a rug. Well, she's making a better effort. Better effort, absolutely. And I think um, there's several things we're doing in terms of the advocacy front. One is uh, requiring special prosecutors. So you know, if Kim Fox is not there, whoever is there, there's always an impartial, independent body who's tasked with holding police officers responsible. Um, the other things is we're trying to change the use of force standards. And so it's more clear that when someone's running away or uh, clearly not holding a weapon, that they can't later claim that they felt threatened. Um, a lot of these trying to fight some of the fact patterns that are are so impossible to defend when you see it on video and you see it, you know, going virally across the world. But it's certainly a significant issue, and there's there's training on implicit bias, so everyone's aware that we all have inherent biases and all those sorts of things. But I think it's going to take time for all that training for the new recruits and for the culture to really change. But in the meantime, it's important to, as Dr. King said, I may, may, not, may not be able to make a, a law, may not make a land, man love me, but to keep him from lynching me, and that's pretty important. So I think as, as long as we can actually put laws in the books to make sure we're holding police officers accountable uh, for, for acting improperly and, and hurting uh, residents' lives, uh, we should make sure we're doing that. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's about it for the questions. We'll take one last question here and then go to rebuttal. Since people are getting double questions, uh, just briefly, uh, you're involved in uh, getting uh, people trained uh, for rehabbing houses and things like that. That's a noble undertaking. Uh, does that involve also, I, I might have missed, I might have already uh, talked about it. Does that involve uh, training to uh, install solar panels and doing environmentally uh, friendly uh, uh, reconstruction? The gentleman's question is uh, in relation to some of the training we provided, the 42 acres it was called. Um, to make sure people are, are, are able to redevelop neighborhoods and become contractors and the, and the like. It's absolutely with that lens in mind. The idea being we want the next generation of developers to be the most environmentally conscious uh, generation. Um, not only because that's what our markets want, but that's our moral obligation. As we're doing everything in every other facet of society to hurt the planet, this should not be one of them. So that's, that's absolutely what we're doing. Okay, give our speaker a hand. Thank you. Right in the middle there. Yeah, let's get it. Thank you. All right. You get a chance to sit down and sit down. I'm sorry. You can sit down and just watch it. Make notes. Make you get the last word. Okay. I know. We'll have a few rebuttals and then you can give a summary. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Oh, this guy. We no. got. Okay. Be Let's have a show of hands of who wants to give a rebuttal. Keep your hands up. We'll get a count. Maybe everybody get 20 minutes tonight. No. Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. And six on this side. Seven, eight. Hey, Charlie, you going to give a rebuttal? Yeah, or no. Sir, I had it up. Nine. Okay. 
somebody's blocking my view back there. Yeah, yeah. yeah somebody's got to get okay. Straight. All right, well, we'll go with four minutes apiece. Uh, who's going to be first? I'll go first. One o'clock. I'll go first. Might as well be provocative. You know, I really appreciate what our speaker is doing. Seems to be making inroads to the right way of doing things, which means uh, empowerment, training, doing the right things to better human life. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that we, I think we've all known for years how we can, you know, create change and stability. It, it, have a, a stable family, a, a stable place to live. And, you know, over the last, and really personally, I think that, uh, you know, no matter what you do. Oh, you're tough. I'll tell you what, I'm going to step down and I'm going to let you guys speak because obviously I got some butterfingers tonight. <laughs> so go ahead, Frank. All right. I uh, just have a question Social to change. all of you. Social you have read Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, or War and Peace? Anybody? I've read Anna Karenina. You need to read Anna Karenina. You, what did you read? War and Peace. War and Peace. You too. Yeah. At what age? For me, it was in high school. I was forced. What's the rebuttal? Well, the question, the, the, I ask this question because uh, when I read this is when I had my first job, I started going to work and uh, the, the bus ride was a long bus ride, about an hour, so I started reading. And uh, it, it kind of changed my, my view of the world. It really affected me profoundly. And uh, uh, I still refer to uh, these, these works of literature when I analyze what's going on today. So that's why I ask, you know, who, who read it and how did it affect you? Uh, like I said, to me it affected me deeply, but I was in my teens, 18 and so on, my first job, and uh, uh, so maybe I was uh, more sensitive, more propensed to be affected, so I don't know. The, the question today is that very few people, I think, have the opportunity uh, to be concentrated in reading so, something that affects them so deeply, because we are distracted by all kind of bullshit, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, propaganda, advertising, misbehaviors that distract us from from concentrating in the things that 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 will affect us very deeply. So that's why I ask the question and why I think it's important for us to ask how we uh, understand the world by 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 reading in uh, literature that analyze. And uh, the other one that that very few people have read is Don Quixote de la Mancha. And that, that was also a, a work that, that, that described the behavior of, of society in those days that we can analyze, as, or use that as a lens to analyze what's going on today. So anyway, that's all, all I have to say. All right, next. Shall you go by age or what? Why don't you go up there and speak? Okay. We'll get all the we'll get all the uh, incomprehensibles out first. <laughs> you, you gotta put the old people first. No, I we say we got a limited life expectancy. You know, I'm, they might not live to I'm saying, speech. I'm saying, I'm saying, speak for 28 hours straight. We yeah, it's probably all incomprehensible. I don't understand myself, but maybe you guys will. I hope. Uh, actually, the gentleman over here, I want to take issue with him. I'm Harris F. Yanovus survivor of World War II Nazi occupation in Greece, seven years in the Chicago slums, and 42 years of marriage to the same woman. <laughs> no, I don't know how she tells me. Yeah. You know, the thing is, this gentleman, I take issue with him about reading books. Me, 
when I was in uh, primary school, I was an A student. When I was in high school, I was a B student. And when I went to college, I was a C student. I graduated close to the bottom of my class. Then I went to law school and passed the exams and everything. Got a law license for 47 years. But after finishing four years of college, if you asked me to take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, I couldn't fill that what I learned in four years of college. So I, after many, many years, I burned all my college books and all the other fiction and nonfiction. And then at the age of 75, oh no, I, I, I lose track, I'm 79. At the age of 65, I started reading the Bible like my father. And like my father who was in the third, third year uh, Greek school, hillbilly from the mountains, shepherd. He said, my boy, you know, the more I read this book, the less I believe. He said, I wish I would never start reading it because he was a very devout and very Christian believing man. Me, after, it took me five years to read the Bible. And after I read it, I learned all my Bibles and my Sunday school books because I discovered that it was a genocidal, misanthropic, geopolitical agenda disguised as a religion. If it offends anybody, you can be offended. You can tell me to go fornicate myself, you know, because I know you guys are all college graduates. You don't have to say I can go after myself. So now the thing is, the country here, I figured, it took me many years to figure out there were 200 million disenfranchised American citizens here. And here we got a, you know, there was a book about 50, 60 years ago. I only read the title a hundred times, but I never read the book, The Ugly American. Now we are governed by a guy who is the most bloodthirsty, the most extreme and most immoral man that ever ruled a nation. And they got a, I'm going to write a new book about this guy the ugliest American. There's never been an American or any other foreign country that has such an ugly man as ruler in character and morals and wild uh, man appearance, wanting to kill millions and millions of people. I mean, there's never been anybody like this. This guy is unprecedented. And you know what? And he, and he's, he, you know what? He's got, to, he's got 120 million people behind him. Yeah. Especially he's got all the bankers, he's got all the churchmen, he's got all the professors, and, and you know, there's a few of them that descend from him. So here's the thing, I volunteer myself to save my country. Now if they elect me president, don't worry, I might not even live for a second term, but I'll try to make one term, and I'm going to abolish the business and the industry of medical care, no doctor, no pharmaceutical president, no stockholder in any medical industry will get more than one million dollars a year. Maximum one million dollars. And then the president will get a million dollars a year. Me, if I become president, I don't need it. I got nineteen hundred dollars a month social security. That's good enough for three meals a day. I don't need it anymore. And you will see a science sucking sound of jobs leaving the American economy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It takes us a little while to digest that one, but we'll try. Uh, keep an open mind, everybody. This is a rebuttal oh, period. You, you uh, who's coming next? Yeah, we could have a race. Here. <laughs> I'll lose. That's all there is. Have to a seat, Margaret. Well, there's not much to say in rebuttal. Um, I'm uh, very impressed with uh, Todd and all he's doing. Um, as you all know, I've been um, uh, a uh, promoter and activist for social justice my whole life. Uh, and um, it, it looks, really looks like he's doing some great things um, without um, becoming too political, although I was surprised that he says he's a lobbyist, and so he has several different hats that he wears. and. Uh, seems to be doing a fine job with that. Um, the reason I brought up a, a couple of things uh, was to, just to let him expound some more. He seems to have um, an eloquent way of uh, uh, describing what he does, and, um, and um, I'm really interested. I think it's amazing he's got um, 
uh, legal team um, because um, you know so much, and we discussed we discussed that in the question and answer period. So much of this um, is legal difficulties and trying to fight around these things. Uh, and uh, I'm glad it was brought up. Uh, the stuff about uh, uh, people who just have a uh, criminal conviction or not even a conviction, an arrest, uh, uh, having their lives destroyed, ruined, uh, um, in many states not being able to vote, um, which again compounds the problem because uh, that, that really is, a, is an outrage. Uh, well, there are so many outrages, but uh, um, that's especially, especially one. Um, luckily in Illinois, I, I don't think there actually is a uh, um, a law that says you can't vote uh, uh, just on the basis of being convicted of a felony. But uh, but this aspect of that you're not able to get a, a job in so many different professions, uh, and uh, or not able to get a license that uh, that really should be should be reversed uh, or at least uh, with uh, the steps that uh, Todd is taking, at least that. If people can get an interview, at least, you know, maybe they have a chance, at least a chance to convince somebody uh, <laughs> of the, their worthiness of a human being uh, as opposed to just, you know, having to check a box and be labeled. Um, there's too much labeling in our society and uh, um, everyone's, everyone's an individual and should be treated with uh, justice and respect. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay. here have always ranged from the ridiculous to the sublime, so I'll let you be the judge of mine. Um, the, gentleman, the, the gentleman who was sitting over there that had all of the stuff about affirmative action and stuff left, right? Yes. Yeah, George, Mike, he wanted to get started on the wall. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to leave before somebody could yell at him. Anyway, um, he talked about this representative saying that uh, that uh, the first thing I want to address is immigration and so-called illegal immigration. Um, the uh, he said that this representative said that after all, Amer African Americans have been here for 200 years. Didn't they? well, you know, he started out with not knowing what the hell he was talking about to begin with, because uh, uh, people were brought here as slaves from Africa before the Mayflower. So that was more than 400 years ago. Um, they were brought here more than 400 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, and and uh, studies are showing a lot of things. One that, for example, immigrant, immigrant groups have lower crime rates than the general population. <coughs> Particularly illegal immigrant groups have lower crime rates, and that makes sense. You don't want to commit a crime and get thrown out of the country. And the second thing is, is that immigrants tend to start businesses and tend to really do, um, to really build communities in areas. So for example, if you go to Little Village, you have a whole immigrant community there, and Pilsen is another area that you have lots of little businesses, lots of little mom and pap stores, lots of little coffee shops and, and grocery stores and restaurants and thing and actual businesses and 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 of course small businesses tend to employ more people than larger businesses. So that you have a whole economy there that's really adding to the to the uh, general economy rather than subtracting from it. So um, the people that bring up this bullshit, <laughs> I'm going to use Go for it, people words. Um, the, the, uh, the people that bring this, uh, yeah, I'm, as, I am an old lady, so I have lost my inhibitory whatever's that I couldn't say fuck in public and I've lost that. Anyway, the second thing I wanted to talk about was Antifa, which is the other thing that he was talking about. And what Antifa was, and I, and I, don't, I don't 
uh, support them in the, some of the violence that they did. But what I, do, but what they were doing. What do you mean? You, can't do, have, you say you can't laugh in public, or you cannot talk about it in public. One fool at a time. You know what? Both. I, okay. I, 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 I say. You're and, me. I say. Keep it civil. Well, I'm people. 70, so. Oh, okay. Anyway. Um, that Antifa, I'm sorry, uh, um, Antifa, I don't support the violence, but they're against a violent group. And if you look at the death toll, it's three people on the, on the uh, white supremacist, fascist, um, uh, KKK neo-Nazi side, because they murdered a woman and two other uh, police officers died during that particular demonstration versus zero on the other side. So if you look at people who were beat up and you look at the death toll, by golly, the neo-Nazis got it. And I also want everybody to know that my father fought in the Second World War in the, in the Fifth Army, and he was, he was in the Colorado National Guard in 19, he got out in uh, April of 1941. So when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, he was reactivated. And he went to Europe. He went to North Africa. He went to Cis he went to Sicily. He was at Anzio. He went up through southern France. They went through the Sudetenland. They freed concentration camps. He was on the front lines for three long years, impossible years, to 1945. And who was he fighting? He was fighting the Nazis. The Nazis were the enemy. And now we have a president that says they're not that bad. What is wrong with this picture? Our good friend and fellow student, Mars, just said that, uh, that George, what's his name, didn't start out knowing what he was talking about. He didn't finish knowing what he was talking about either. <laughs> <laughs> With regard to the Anfas, I will say simply this. There's an old saying that goes, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. If these people go to somewhere like Charlottesville and they stir up all this trouble, then what is it they think's going to happen? Um, that some of these people are going to get killed? Well, Marge was right. They murdered this poor young woman down there in Charlottesville, and two cops died because of this. Uh, with regard to the subject of the novel, The Ugly American, I've read it. The novel takes place about um, 55 or 60 years ago in a country, in an imaginary Southeast Asian country called Sarkhan in the novel. And the novel tells the story of an American diplomat who was a young American diplomat who was played in the movie by Marlon Brando. And he is doing his best to try and take the corrupt government of Sarkhan and get it to a more rational basis while it's also busy fighting a war against communism. If all of this sounds suspiciously like what was going on in what then was South Vietnam, that's not a coincidence. And the novel is an expose of what the U.S. government was doing in South Vietnam at that time. It was a bestseller, and as I said, it was made into a movie. Thank you. All right, I want to finish my rebuttal. Go for it, Tim. Don't, don't touch right. the mic. There's rules against it. All right. <laughs> we got to take one extra minute. Huh? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 You, you know, I, wanted, what I really want to say is this. Globalization and capitalism have been the best creators of jobs throughout the entire Let world. Let the man speak. Oh, okay. Sweatshops, Charlie, as I've told you before, on a lot of the online stuff are a necessary step for the development of a country. But it's short-lived. People want to work and they want to go. I'm also going to advocate we have the freedom to move goods all over the world. We have the freedom to move capital all over the world. The thing we don't have is the ability to move people all over the world. If they had a chance they'd be coming here and leaving their own countries. And in a sense, we would be in the competition for settlers or, or whatever. And you'd just find some of these governments 
reforming themselves to bring back and get their cultures under control. You see, I may be more of a libertarian than most people that like, but I'm also a rationalist too as well. Mr. Trump, if you want peace and prosperity, and you want free flow of capital, get rid of the tariffs. If you want free flow of jobs and make America first, trade with the world. If you want freedom and you want social engineering, I'll go back and paraphrase a quote that we all shall recognize about the immigrants, about trade, and about the spread of democracy. Mr. Trump, tear down this wall. <laughs> well, I told you, you got for again, uh, <coughs> yeah. I want to thank our speaker. Uh, unfortunately, I got here late, so I missed a lot of the presentation. But I think the Q and A answers uh, alone were were very very good, and I'm glad I came. They alone were well worth it. And Charlie. You should be getting more U of C people here. Obviously, they do a great job. You give great talks and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, I do have uh, I do have a couple uh, quarrels though. The police statistics. While uh, you were talking about this, I looked it up on the internet, and of course, we know everything on the internet is correct. But the statistics I saw on the internet indicate that the Chicago Police Department demographics are almost perfectly aligned with the population. And we can talk about that later. I think about 32% black population and 29% police department, and similar for Hispanic and white. Um, but, you know, that, that we can take a look at. Um, with regard to Margaret's remarks about immigrants, I would add that in addition to crime rates being lower for immigrants, unemployment rates are also lower for immigrants than for the population uh, as a whole. Uh, my overall quarrel, while I, I grant Ted that what he's saying about discrimination is true, particularly in the uh, employment arena, uh, I think that, we've, the, that the way the country is going now, we have a bigger problem and I've come up with an acronym here, which I, F-I-T-A, I won't even say, even in this uh, crowd, which is rather uh, open-minded, uh, F-I-T-A, that's what's getting happening to all of us, uh, black, white, and everybody, uh, by the economic and political structures that we have now. And if you haven't figured out F-I-T-A yet, I'll give you a clue. The A stands for uh, a person's posterior, okay? The rest of it you gotta figure out. But it's happening to all of us. It's, it's not just happening to minorities. It is happening disproportionately uh, to minorities. When we have a situation where CEOs are earning 300 times what their workers are earning, uh, this is certainly a, a major problem. And that's not black or white CEOs or black or white employees, it's, it's overall. 300 times as much in many cases uh, as the average worker. Uh, and my take on this is that uh, uh, the tax system, I asked a question about this, uh, and, and I agree with the speaker on this. Uh, he, he said, yes, we need a progressive tax system. Yes, we all know that. Uh, the, the soda tax is a regressive tax, and therefore, you know, this business about it's gonna make our children skinny. Uh, is, is BS, it's political BS. That's, they, they need the money, uh, they aren't able to get it through an income tax easily enough, so they get it the easy way, any easy way they can. And that's the way sales taxes are in general. And I think we're all aware here, the problem with getting a progressive tax in Illinois is that it's a constitutional <coughs> issue, and we have to have a constitutional amendment before we can change the fact that our income taxes are flat taxes. Um, and one short added note here, uh, the police problem I think could be solved. I, I've always favored something which not too many people favor, and that is national service. Uh, 
a draft, not necessarily a military draft, but a draft to some form of national service for young people for a year or two. Uh, yes, we, the military could draw from this, but so could programs like CETA and the Peace Corps and various other uh, yeah, issues. Get, uh, and what, we, what I would propose is that uh, many of these young people would be trained in police work, at least at a, at, a, at a basic level, and would work in policing in the neighborhoods that they came from. Thank you. See what's going on here. All right, let's thank our speaker for a nice presentation and for his efforts. And let's thank Social Change. I'll be eclectic as usual here and talk about a topic of which I have little or no knowledge or understanding. Go for it, Charlie. That's what's that was included me. I'm going to talk about hiring people. And union representatives don't get involved in that because we only represent people on the job, we don't represent people who have not been hired. So I don't know what personnel officers precisely do in this area, and it's a part of labor law I'm not really crisp on, but I do have some idea. Now, when you go to apply for a job, <coughs> I'm talking about legislation that would damage you, uh, your chances of being employed or seeking advancement. Now, people hand in a resume and they fill out an application. Uh, most of the time the resumes aren't very accurate. On an application, uh, if you omit something or falsify it at any given time, it's usually uh, the basis for uh, the employer can remove you from the position. So it is a, a serious matter what, what is on there. Um, the employers retain the right to hire. There are certain rights in the world, but one of the employer rights, and it's very difficult to go after this, is their right to determine uh, their employees and um, we do try unions come in and try to affect who they promote uh, of those they hired but it doesn't extend to the initial applicant process um, now uh, the question came up uh, the other thing is I, I had occasion to represent employees in, in, in civil service, of which there are all sorts of investigations undertaken, both for new applicants uh, generally. So uh, the, determining what's on a record or not is important in those contexts. Now, the personnel officers out there, I assure you with today's electronic age and sharing of records, are pretty slick. Pretty, pretty, they're pretty up to what's going on and digging up stuff. More so, I think it, this is, this disheartens me because they, uh, they're not my favorite people and I don't like their practices, but uh, that's it. Now, um, the, the other thing is, um, Regarding applications and, and, and holding you back, the, the thing I, 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 I don't need to get into this, but I was somewhat surprised to hear that certain occupations are precluded on the basis of your record, whatever that may be. Um, that's called the nex a nexus. And I don't know if that's that extensive. Now, they had a nexus between uh, someone employed in a school setting and certain things that you have been uh, found guilty of, such as child molestation. You could preclude it from having a position in a school. Um, I don't know how extensive a nexus is. There were certain things, like if you had a drug conviction, would you be 
precluded from operating a, a vehicle, a transportation vehicle, perhaps. I don't know. I have no idea, but that nullifies it uh, altogether. Um, <coughs> what's to be done about this? Um, I don't really know. Uh, I don't like any of these applications because it presupposes that so many things that, yes, you mentioned one rehabilitation, and there's never a restoration of records or a time frame of it. Oh, and the one thing I wanted to mention, I actually had a case like this, and I argued this one. This one really, really killed me. I was representing security personnel, and they, I got what the employee has called it. We work also. We know our records are crucial because I uh, many, many, many times, thousand times, I've worked to what is get a clean paper, meaning even if you're fired for just cause and all kinds of stuff, they get a clean paper, meaning the employer will never say why. Well, they just say, well, the person terminated their position. Well, we get the person to resign. But I discovered in this one case, and this was among police officials, they wanted a code on the form, which I just happened to catch. And I still remember it was like R3 or something. And I said, what specifically, why? Hey, yeah, they got rid of the other language. They said why the person was terminated and so forth from the force. But, the, but they wanted to leave R3 in. And I could never find out from them what R3 stood for on the record. Nevertheless, they finally agreed to remove it, but they never confessed to me what that was. So I said, they were really insistent. They weren't going to do this. And I said, well, what is this? What does it mean? But apparently it's some code on that profession that you're perhaps someone that should not be rehired or hired elsewhere. Anyhow, thanks a lot. I learned a lot here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, you don't know anything about the, you don't know anything about the world of work. Yeah, right. You gotta, he's got to read Annika. Right? You got to read some novel. I did. It's called Super Fuel. Yeah, you got to read some novels. Yeah. You got to read Charles Dickens. I know. I know what cell phones, Charlie. It's very simple. Oh. Oliver Twist is coming to town, yeah. and he knows how you live. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. I, I have a confession to make up front. I've been in two cults in my lifetime, and it took uh, a while and the help from friends to help me escape from those cults. One was the cult of Amway in 1975. You have to believe with a religious fervor that you're going to rise to the top and become a millionaire if you follow their instructions. It has all, being an Amway distributor has all the earmarks of a religious cult. And the other cult I was in was the belief that we would uh, get clean, cheap, safe electricity from nuclear power back in 1977, 78. 79, 80, and it took me a little while after Three Mile Island I started to read and I got out of the atom, the cult of the atom. There's actually a book called The Cult of the Atom that was written uh, 40 years ago. But in any case, today people are living, many people believe in the cult of free enterprise capitalism. <laughs> and uh, the article that I, I quoted earlier, I made enough copies for everybody here tonight. The last thing he says is, if we have a future, we have to do something about our economy and the world being run by capitalism and capitalists. He said, that's a prescription for disaster, and we have no future by 2050, 32 years from now, quite a bit of the planet is going to be uninhabitable for humans if we don't address the predatory capitalism that is polluting the environment, destroying things. Um, incidentally, what's been in the news this last week is about everybody's ranting and raving about Kim Jong-un uh, having a nuclear missile. Well, it's been solid knowledge since 1985 that if you do want to deliver a bomb to a city, you don't 
fire it up in the air in a missile where all the satellites can see where it came from right away. That's like walking up to six well-armed Chicago policemen and pulling out a gun. And it's an instant suicide. If you want to deliver nuclear weapons, all you need is 12 bombs. 12 bombs the size of the Hiroshima blast. Those things have been condensed down the size of a football you can carry around in a purse. One man wrote an article in 1985. He said, take 12 of these weapons, put them in nurses' uh, backpacks or purses, load them onto motorcycles, and just drive them into cities near six nuclear power plants, six major cities. It's called a 12-bomb war. With a dozen motorcycles, you could eliminate virtually any country on Earth. As he said, the old, the old in, uh, commercial used to say, Kawasaki lets the good times roll. Well, there you are. No, the missiles, other countries are saying, we don't need any stinking missiles. We have compact, portable nukes. You can bring them in boats, cars, whatever. Missiles are obsolete and have been for 30 years, but the public doesn't know that. The press is still promoting that myth. Today we're living under the myth, incidentally, a lot of the problems he talked about today, a lot, the militarization of the police has been driven by Homeland Security and the idea that we have terrorists lurking among us. And that philosophy stems from the poisonous tree that was planted in this country on 9-11. Two weeks ago, I, I produced another fact sheet with the three simple basic facts about 9-11 that are known. I've been bringing facts in here. I've been summarizing books and bringing facts to this college for 10 years. And many of you people heaped tremendous scorn on me 10 years ago. Some people even got up and walked out because they couldn't handle the truth, which was in the early stages, but solidly documented. Today, these facts aren't Andy's opinion. They're facts. Thousands of scientists have produced the forensic evidence. You puncture the myth of 9-11, bring the troops home from everywhere, like Spendley Butler talked about, General Butler, he said, draw a 200-mile radius around the United States. Let our Navy and our Marines and everybody defend that. We don't need to be spending a trillion dollars in foreign countries giving the military something to do so that the billionaire companies that supply the military, they can keep the orders going. Butler wrote that war is a racket. It's a racket run by billionaire corporations. They're not fighting for freedom and justice anywhere in the world. If we, we puncture that myth, it'll go a long way toward freeing up a trillion dollars a year of money that could be used to solve all the problems you were talking about tonight. And if we stop the militarization of the police, it will go a long way toward leveling out our criminal justice system. So if we have more jobs in America, a lot of people won't be getting arrested for running drugs or anything else. I, would, I meant to ask, I'd, I'd like our speaker to address one final question. Nobody asked it. What do we tell a high school student that graduates from the inner city of Chicago, the general? A bunch of thousands of students graduate every year and they're looking out, there's no jobs. The factories that used to be here moved to China, Mexico, those jobs are gone. What, how are we helping people get jobs? Um, one last note. Our speaker tonight mentioned that uh, you know education by film, uh, you know, is a quick way. Uh, in watching a film is as good as reading 20 or 30 books, right? If, if, am I correct in assuming that you can spend a lot of time doing research yourself? But if you watch one film that they summarize it. Well, there's, there's a few films out that will help you uh, rapidly get up to speed in the 20th century. Uh, there's two of them. One's called Positive Hell. The other one, that's new, out of Europe. The other one's called House of Numbers. Those two films will give you a rapid education on the hoax, the entire hoax of the internet right now. There's a film called Anatomy of a Great Deception that was made by a man, I forget the guy's name, he made it in 2011. It's a DVD about 90 minutes he made for his wife. It's a documentary about a man that started thinking about 9-11. He had questions and then his life just got sucked down a rabbit hole and he was losing his marriage because his wife thought he was crazy. I've seen that. Well, the anatomy of a great deception, it's a good one. 
Michael Moore's movie a year ago, Where to Invade Next, is a classic example of good things going on in other countries that could we have we could have here if we addressed the billionaire predator killers that are currently running our government. That's the only way to describe them, is billionaire killers. I'm sorry your ch child can't afford the medicine. If you can't sell your house, well, the kid dies. I need my billions. That's what these companies are telling us. Naomi Klein and David Ray Griffin are two of the best authors if you want to know what's going on in the world. Naomi Klein has written The Shock Doctrine uh, and uh, What Happens Next, I think. Or, uh, her, her classic was The Shock Doctrine, and that's being practiced right now in the wake of the hurricanes. Irma and Harvey out of Texas, the billionaires are moving in, buying up property. Uh, there, it's, a, it's a bonanza for them. Professor Griffin has produced 11 books on 9-11. His current book is Bush and Cheney, How They Ruined America and the World. It gives you in one book, you get a whole summary of the reality. Now, the final note, the, the updated to this thing is coming out. If, if you can only read one book a year, I would suggest Censored News, their annual Censored News book that comes out. The 2018 edition will be out October 3rd, and it's got to be loaded with the top 25 blacked out stories of the year. Incidentally, Project Censure has been up and running for 40 years. This will be the 41st edition this year. The 2011 edition had, all, all, it culminated and summarized six years worth of research on the lies that the media told us. We've been submerged in bald-faced lies since September 2001. And it started before that. The idea that capitalism is the best thing started back in 1973 with Lewis Powell saying uh, the rich people got to start taking equity back. Uh, the, the middle class is getting too strong. So right now there's our government today is populated by billionaire and multi-millionaire predators and almost every one of those white men has racist tendencies that we haven't seen in this country in 50 years congregating in the government. So uh, Get a copy of Censor News or log on to Project Censor. They have a website, Project Censor. And the other website that has the best of the best news every day is Common Dreams. I mention that every time, Common Dreams. If you want to stay right. alert and know what's happening in the world, log on to Common Dreams every day. I'd like to ask you a question, Andy. What question? Um, have you heard recently about the uh, HARP weather array being used to augment the strength of hurricanes? Uh, the question is, uh, do I know anything about HARP uh, being used to augment the strength of hurricanes to damage other nations or just uh, change the weather? No, I have not studied that, and uh, that may be one of the things that is uh, information may be planted as disinformation to throw us off the track of the fact that the hurricanes are getting stronger because of climate change, not because of HARP and uh, weather modification. So there's a whole bunch of junk on the internet that is disinformation that we have to sort through. And, and it takes a while. I haven't researched this yet, so okay. but my guess is that that's disinformation. To, to, to slow down the spread of the knowledge that we have to get off fossil fuel and we have to do something about climate change. Okay? Another rebuttal here? All right. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my dad had a Volkswagen. In the winter, we'd be driving around, and there would be a thick cloud of smoke in the car. Because he wouldn't roll down the window, and he's sitting there smoking his Marlboros. And I was just gagging. And, uh, and I was unusual, because I went around going, smoking sucks. Right. What was normal, everybody just accepted it as normal. Um, they, when the scientists started showing that this was a problem, everybody complained, the users, the retailers, the manufacturers, um, even the federal government wanted to support uh, the tobacco industry. Eventually, people woke up, and now we look back in hindsight and go, wow, what we were thinking, we're a nation of addicts. We still have some problems, but we're managing a lot better. Now we're experiencing something that's similar with sugar. If you listen to these ads from, uh, arguing against the tax, they're, you, they're, you're listening to users, the mothers who are buying the 
the, uh, the sugar products, you're listening to the retailers, you're listening to the distributors, the people you're not hearing anything from that are against tax are the doctors. If you go out there and you read the science, sugar is addictive. Sugar drinks have zero, zero nutritional value. And it contains an ingredient that's scientifically shown, the doctors all agree, it's addictive. And it ends up resulting in uh, uh, heart disease, which is um, like uh, uh, heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. Change. And here's the crazy thing. Change. Child onset diabetes is a modern disease. This wasn't around 100 years ago or 50 years ago. This is a modern disease. We have obese children. So what I'm suggesting is that we're kind of stuck repeating history and that we have this addictive product and you're hearing a lot of people going through withdrawal symptoms. They want to avoid the withdrawal symptoms. And what I would suggest is, and this is related to um, our speaker, we have a population that's economically challenged, um, including a screwed up system, and now we're selling them products that are going to send them to a healthcare system that we all know is already screwed up. It's, it's, it, it's a system that's going to hurt the public and especially the poor. So my comment is, or my suggestion is to look at this and to bite the bullet and start fighting the addictive product. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take a recut on that one. Okay, speaker, this is the last one. All right, I know this, but on the uh, on the rebutting of the cigarette tax, or I should say the sugary drink tax, we just take a small example from the cigarette tax. You know, all it takes for me is to go to McHenry County. I don't pay no taxes on cigarettes. They're six bucks a pack out in McHenry County. You come into Chicago, they're $13 a pack. When you're poor, it's a lot of money, and you're going to probably relocate on something like that. Now, I all, I all agree with you. This is an addictive product. It's no good. I admit I'm a laboratory rat with it. But, you know, if you're going to do it right, make it nationwide. Do it like the Canadians do. But the thing is, there's still going to be a market for this stuff, and it'll just be driven on the ground. We tried it once. It was called prohibition. And look what happened there. Yeah, look there to the free market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get our speaker up there. Oh, you know, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a nurse, so I was going to do something medical to counteract the bullshit that he just said. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Margaret? Are you gonna what is it, Margaret? Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you stay right there, sir, because I'm going to take two minutes. All right, Margaret, please. Blast me out of the Okay, then people that we want to stop smoking or not start smoking are young people right. who do not buy cigarettes, and more of them do not buy cigarettes as the price goes up. So that's where the big deal comes in. And actually, it also affects people who are too poor to pay for the increased cost of cigarettes and don't have a car to drive out to McHenry County. The second thing about sugar, and, and, and you, you were talking, who was talking about, we have children who weigh 100 pounds when they are seven years old. And it's, you know, the, pro the thing about it is, is that it's probably much more complicated than just a lot of sugar that they drink. That absolutely does not help, and it may even be stimulating the problem. But we do have nine-year-olds. There, there are two kinds of diabetes. One is the kind that, that, the, that the pancreas dies, or the, the, the cells in the pancreas that produce the insulin mm -hmm. just die, and then you have insulin-dependent yeah. diabetes right away, and that's the kind that usually killed people. The one that's a slow onset is called adult onset. 
or used to be called adult onset, is called type 2 diabetes. Now, excuse me. It got in my pocket. Can you believe it? Um, it's called type 2 diabetes, and it, it originally starts out as an in, inadequacy of the beta cells in the pancreas of the goose insulin. And that is heavily influenced, one, heredity, and two, diet. But if you're doing the, and, and three is exercise, which none of us are doing enough. And so, um, anyway, so that's, you know, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that, but sugar drinks do not help it at all. And if we can keep people from starting drinking, people should be drinking water, except now the water's not safe, so what the hell. <laughs> okay. Margaret, thank you. Thank you. Poor people have a way of beating the system. If anybody wants to buy cigarettes from Indiana, my neighborhood, <laughs> my friend Jim takes the train down to Indiana about every two week or two, and you just give him the money, and he'll pick up the smokes for you. They're cheaper in Bensonville. <laughs> I'm not sure if you intended for that commercial on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's give another hand for our Thank speaker. you all for the time. I really appreciate this. It's certainly a playground for ideas, and it's great to be around so many thinkers who think so many different things. Um, I want to respond to the, the most poignant uh, response to something I mentioned in terms of statistics, but also to the question that was posed uh, relating to what do we do with our youth once they graduate. Um, the gentleman uh, mentioned, uh, I mentioned a statistic about 75% of the police officers being white and communities are non white. Uh, that was from a New York Times article talking about uh, neighborhoods like um, Stone Park and Blue Island, parts of the, the city, where there's a disproportionate number of white cops, but also the larger phenomenon where the assignment of officers to black communities, not necessarily the overall force, but the overall action and implementation of policy that allows a disproportionate number of white cops, usually the younger ones, who are then drawn into communities that they have no background with or understanding of the populations. And that's where a lot of these issues arise. So that's where that came from. So the question um, uh, related to what are we going to tell our youth, I think that's why we're actually working on these alternative forms of education. We understand our education systems are failing our communities, um, by and large. And uh, we can't rely on the, the public system to get better uh, for, for youth who don't necessarily have a strong enough voice to demand that. So what we can do in the interim is to provide them the concrete skills necessary for them to become marketable. When we get the 75,000, you know, an hour, uh, not an hour, 75, geez, 75,000 a year starting pay jobs that, that their creativity and skills set it merits. So that's why we have the Developers Academy to teach people how to do the, the app development, but also to develop neighborhoods. So they have skills that, met, that are transferable, but also ones that represent a significant gap in, in jobs and represent where, where the jobs of the future are going. But thank you all again. Uh, this has been an absolute privilege and pre pleasure. Thank you all to the staff. Thank you to Mr. Paddock and Ms. Ms. Uh, Heather for being kind and delivering food and everything to everyone. And uh, I hope to have a chance to speak with you all again. But if I can't see you tomorrow at the art thing, please make sure you come. Uh, the Social Change Film Festival and have cards for anyone who wants them. Make sure you can stay in touch. But also have an easy way to be reminded of where our website is. Thank you very much. I appreciate all it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Gavel us out, Andy. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you right. very much. Okay, this is uh, the end of the College of Complexes for Saturday night, September 23rd. So it'll be posted on what? YouTube. Video on YouTube shortly. No. Well, I don't know. What, where is it posted, that's Tim? That's Friday. Oh, he's talking to somebody so else. Awesome. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I'll, I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. I was just going to announce where, where it is for people that are On looking. the College of Complexes website, you take a look at the camera. Oh, there'll be past art that'll go all the way back to 2010. You can also go to my website at www.timsvideo.com. <laughs> Click on the College of Complexes note, and you will see there a complete index of what I have posted from 2010 until today. There are some that are not up, either because of me, uh, use, that's usually at the speaker's request. Okay. So, well, thank you. Well, we'll see you all next week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>